So welcome everybody for joining in today's lecture. I'm teaching a bunch of first year students, uh, teaching mathematics to the computer science and engineering major students. Uh, the goal for this lecture is to make them understand the, the current situation of coronavirus and, and the mathematical uh, mathematics that's going under the widespread transmission of coronavirus. So today, in today's lecture, uh, we'll be going over some of the mathematical models that's used for uh, virus transmission or infectious disease transmission. We will see how to develop a mathematical model. So, for example, we'll see some of the exponential curves that's going on online that you see all the time. So we will try to get some meaning out of that. And that's pretty much what the goal for today's lecture. So I'm going to share the screen. So uh, the, the title for today's lecture is Mathematics Behind the Transmission of Coronavirus. Uh, so I'll be, uh, I'll be going over some of these ideas and how this transmits. So you see a lot of things going on in social media, but I think today uh, you'll have some uh, basic, un basic mathematical understand understanding of that. So it will make things a little more exciting and interesting and insightful for you. Uh, that's what the goal for today's lecture is all about. Okay. All right, so the COVID-19 coronavirus. Uh, this, is, this is what the uh, graph and the actual data that I found today, this morning, uh, 11 a.m., 11 in the morning today. So uh, you see that almost uh, three, 381,000, more than 381,000 people uh, confirmed cases, meaning they're infected one way or another. And China is still at the top, and then there comes the Italy. So you look at the graph, this is clearly an exponential graph. So it started from here, and then a little bit of peak, and then it's still growing up exponentially. That's for the entire population of the world. Now, now that was 10 days ago. Now today is 24th, uh, 10 days ago. Um, 14th, um, it was 145,000, and 10 days later is 381,000. So <laughs> look at the scale. Uh, it's, it was on the scale of 100K, and now it is on the scale of 400K. So uh, it's almost four times in 10 days. Can you imagine how dangerous it's, it's going to get and how, how fast it is evolving? It's an exponential curve. And if you look at here, uh, that's uh, the orange one is the China. So uh, for China, it started increasing, increasing, and then it sort of slowed down for China. So uh, you might be wondering why it slowed down for China at the moment. Um, we will have an answer by the end of the lecture. And then for the rest of the world, it's still exponential. It's growing. All right, so COVID-19, let's see, let's look at the case of Bangladesh. Um, so uh, I have taken this um, picture from John Hopkins University. Um, they have a, a dashboard, you can check it out online if you would like to. So that's the dashboard, um, you have it at the John Hopkins University, it's live, you can interact with it. So um, you can play, play with it later. Now- So in over five in Bangladesh, All right, so, so 33 confirmed cases in Bangladesh and five people recovered, five people recovered in Bangladesh uh, and, and, and three people, yeah. So five people recovered and three people died. Um, that was in the morning, in the evening I heard one, and one more person died today, so the total death is four today. Um, so they haven't updated the website yet, uh, but you see the look at the graph for Bangladesh even. It's, it, was, it started very slow, but you see that the exponential behavior of the curve, which is, uh, which is getting, only getting dangerous. Um, that's what we can see from there. Now, the existing data for the world that we have is taken from the UCL University College London's website, Professor uh, Mark Henley's website. Um, so, if you look at the graph, it's updated last night, uh, 23rd March, um, so only a few hours ago, it's, a very, it's the latest graph that I have. Uh, so, it's based on the 
this current data that we have. So in the morning, it was 381,000. Uh, but if you look at it live right now, look at it live right now. So it's 392,000. So yeah, you see it's increasing at an alarming rate. So, all right, so based on this data, uh, we have the graph. And if you look at the behavior of the graph, um, so it's a graph, exponential graph on the linear scale. Um, and um, you see that China is at the top, but again, you see that China, it sort of slowed down for China at this point after reaching its peak. Uh, but in case of Italy, it's uh, still an exponential growth. It's a, a tr upward trajectory for Italy. And uh, for USA, all right, so I'm gonna talk about USA in a moment, but you see uh, for Iran, that's Iran. So it's not that much of an upward trajectory. The growth rate is a little bit less than the uh, China and Italy, but still it's an exponential growth. Um, and then in the case of North Korea, and look at Japan, it's at the bottom. So, um, which looks great. Uh, I don't know what these Japanese people are doing, but whatever they're doing, they're doing it in the right way. Uh, so, but look at USA, this um, purple color graph, um, that's USA. That's an indicator, USA. So look at USA. Uh, it looks like an outlier, outlier. Uh, so we, what that means, I mean, look at the graph of USA, the growth rate, the exponential growth rate for USA is very high. And it, from the graph, you can, you can, you can say that, um, so, these are the number of days. So within five days, USA will uh, exit the exit by the number of uh, confirmed cases. Um, exit Italy by the number of confirmed cases. So within five days, looking at the behavior of the graph, we can say that in five days um, there will be more infected people than Italy uh, in the USA. So which is uh, a dangerous news for. The American people. Okay, so how this kind of modeling uh, is done uh, by the mathematicians, computer scientists, or um, um, people who are involved in mathematical modeling of some sort. So uh, we will we will look at a very uh, simplistic kind of model uh, for uh, contagion uh, for disease transmission. So we have the first wave. Uh, so in the first wave, um, so people come in contact, an infected person might want to come in, might come in contact with other uh, normal healthy people with probability P and, uh, uh, and suppose he meets K number of people, uh, K, and K number of um, healthy people. So with probability P, if he's made, meeting K number of people, by meeting, uh, I mean, um, with an ability to um, uh, to infect others, so that kind of meeting. So, um, so, so not every meeting will infect others. So you might see someone current with coronavirus. You you may be it, within the close proximity, but you might not get affected. Oftentimes, uh, so by by this number of meeting K, I mean um, a meeting that will cause in, um, some sort of infection. It's an infectious disease. Uh, contagious disease. Uh, so uh, in the second wave, what will happen, each infected person um, will meet another K number of new people and transmit this infection with probability P. Um, in the third case, uh, in the third wave, uh, the population we can, for the third case, we can actually, third wave, we can actually organize it in some sort of tree. So uh, and uh, Galton Watson branching stochastic process. So the process we can uh, model the branch this in terms of a tree is called Galton Watson branching stochastic process uh, discovered by these scientists. So they are the first who uh, sort of model this in this way. Now see the branching. Uh, so maybe this is the first person with infection uh, with uh, the disease or virus, and and. Um, he meets with other people with a certain probability. So there are three people, he probably uh, meeting this person is zero, so he didn't meet this person, but he probably met these two other people, uh, other persons, and uh, they got infected by this person. 
That's the first wave. In the second wave, um, this person meets, he has three choices to meet, let's say, and he meets one of them, uh, so, uh, and they got infected. So this person infects two other, other people. This person didn't infect this guy, but infected this guy, and this guy probably after infection, you know, he was in self-quarantine like you or me, or maybe um, he took some measure or good, some good medical health care, so he didn't get, he didn't infect other people. So the transmission stopped for this branch in here, but this guy kept infecting other, other people. So if that keeps going, situation will turn out to be very dangerous. So, but what is the solution for that? So if people st stop meeting other people, uh, so in, in this case, this guy met only two people, and then uh, this guy didn't meet anyone, so he was in self-quarantine at, quarantine at home probably. Uh, this guy infected one other person, but this guy, you know, was in self-quarantine at home. So, so the propagation sort of stopped. Are you still following me? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So I said with probability P uh, and the number of people the person is meeting, that would be, uh, that would play a crucial role in the propagation of this virus. Uh, so, um, so, in, so that would be the average number of secondary infection from one node. So that was the one node, let's say, and then this portion, this is a secondary infection. So, and then if you have more and more uh, waves and branches, then the entire middle, middle portion would be the secondary infection. Secondary infection, if we know the information about secondary information, infection, then we can sort of uh, come up with different insights that are going to be helpful. But this number, P of K, P, probability P multiplied with the number of people meeting K, that's very important. Why? You will see. Um, now, this number, probability P and the people meeting with, uh, number of people meeting K, uh, we can um, label them as R0. Uh, so what this R0 means is the average number of new infected people on every, every wave or every step. Now that's for one step, uh, R0, but what happens with N steps? If my tree is big enough, then we have like, a, let's say N step, then I take this number and uh, you know, make it to the power n on both sides. So that's what I'm doing here. So R0 to the power n here, and P, of, uh, P and K multiplied to the power n. Now, um, if R0 is greater uh, than one, uh, then, the average, um, then the average grows geometrically as R to the power n. So uh, what that means is if you stop meeting people, and let's say, all right, so if you, mm, okay, so if you meet more people, um, uh, so more than one people, so if, you, if you're meeting like two people, three people every day, uh, interacting with them, so the disease will propagate and it will grow geometrically. Um, and um, if you meet less people, less, less than one, so let's say point high on an average, I mean, uh, as an individual, you, can, <laughs> you cannot meet half people, but on an average, if the, a number of meeting between people is less than one, then it shrinks geometrically, which means it's going slowing down the uh, propagation of the disease. Now, when n goes to t, the geometric growth. Uh, so geometric growth is for uh, uh, a discrete case, and exponential growth is for a continuous case. So pretty much a, a sort of analogous here. So R not, as I said, that's a, a basic problem, a reproduction number which is basically, um, you know, um, so, so all right, I'll, I'll introduce a few other terminologies here. So um, susceptible, uh, susceptible people. So uh, let's move, all right. So, all right, like I said, R0 is a basic reproduction number, meaning uh, the average number of uh, people you're meeting uh, for each, at each node. So that number from experience, from past experience of other, um, uh, you know, pandemic or epidemic. So what is a pandemic and epidemic? They're, this, the, the, they, they sound pretty much similar. They almost mean pretty much similar. There's a subtle difference. Uh, so an epidemic is, let's say, it, it's within a region. So let's say it's in Asia or in China or, you know, in a particular region. Uh, so, and and uh, an epidemic is a 
array. So a pandemic is a kind of epidemic that uh, spreads all over the world. So uh, coronavirus is an epidemic and also a pandemic because it uh, spreads all over the world. But for the case of disease modeling or uh, pandemic and epidemic, um, it works the, almost the same way. Now, from the past experience of our pandemic or epidemic understanding, this R0 is already determined. So for different, um, so diphtheria is saliva, you know, um, but for SARS, it was airborne droplet. And for the case of coronavirus, it is still airborne droplet. So the value of R0 for coronavirus would be two to five. Uh, so uh, it has a lot of resemblance with the SARS uh, virus th that was an outbreak previously. So we're going to do a mathematical modeling, and, and the kind of mathematical modeling we will do is called compartmental model. Uh, it was discovered by these two guys, uh, Carmack and McKendrick, <laughs> in, in 1927. And we're going to use the deterministic com compartmental model, SIR population uh, classes. So what this S, I, and R mean? Uh, so S means susceptible. Uh, susceptible means, um, you know, people who haven't got infected yet, mm, uh, they're still in good health, um, probably like you and I. Uh, um, so, and, and infected people are already infected. Um, and R of T, is the number of people who got recovered from after the infection. So somebody got coronavirus and then they sort of recovered. So these are the number of people's, uh, people. So these are all probabilistic. We're talking about probability here. Uh, so S of T, I of T, and R of T, these are all, all probabilistic. And it's a mixed model. In the case of coronavirus, when we're trying to model coronavirus, we're going to assume that um, you know, total population remains the same meaning that, you know, usually epidemics or pandemics are not, uh, they do not last for years after years, maybe six months, eight months, one year, uh, but a drastical effect uh, remains. So it's a short period of time. It happens uh, for a relatively shorter period of time. And we are going to make some simplifying assumptions. Uh, so what the assumption would be, one of them would be, no new birth is included. So um, around the world, we're going to assume during the time of pandemic, we haven't got a lot of new population uh, added to the existing population, that kind of assumptions. So we're going to also um, sort of um, assume not a lot of death because we have like how many people in this world? I don't know, I think 7 billion, maybe a lot more. I don't know. So, uh, you know, uh, losing only a few thousand doesn't really uh, make a lot of difference. I mean, we're going to make some simplification, some simplifying assumptions to begin with, um, to to um, to, um, to to construct our uh, simplest model. So the models that we have here, you see, SI model, SIS model, SIR, SEIR, all these different uh, kinds of uh, models that we have. We'll talk about some of them uh, today. Um, let, let's begin with this SI model, the, the first simplest model. So uh, susceptible people are the healthy people and um, infected people are the people who are already infected by some sort of virus, let's say coronavirus. And we have two groups here, clearly. Uh, yeah. So we clearly have two groups here, uh, S and I, susceptible people and infected people. Initially, the number of susceptible people will be more than the infected people. Let's say only 10% of the population is infected now. Um, and then uh, the number of susceptible people will go from this group to that group, which means that people will start getting infected and the number of infected people will be more. And that kind of thing will happen in, for, in, if that kind of thing, or that kind of things will happen in this model. So, but uh, then again, the total number of population will remain the same. The susceptible people and infected, infected people put together to construct the total number of population. Now, beta is the transmission rate, the infection rate, okay? And the time for, uh, uh, for transmitting contact is one over beta. Um, and the infection equation that we get, um, all right, so let's, let's uh, try to understand this a little bit. So this is the number of infected people, now the fraction of the infected people, let's say. Um, and then beta is the transmission rate or infection rate. 
and the number uh, or a certain portion, a portion of susceptible people, um, or so this is a fraction uh, associated with people over and the entire population. So this is a portion of the susceptible people come in contact with the infected people uh, with the transmission rate uh, beta uh, over time delta t. So initially the time was t, and then after all right, the next time would be delta t over a time of delta t. If the susceptible people come in contact with the infected people uh, with the rate transmission rate beta, and that would be the new infected people will be added to the existing infected people, and that will that will give us the um, give us the um, the new uh, total infected people, so t plus delta t over that period of time. Now that's what pretty much this equation is saying. Um, so I'm sort of uh, um, all right. So this kind of modeling involves differential equations. I'm sure uh, as a freshman, um, a first semester freshman student, you are not already familiar with differential equation uh, to that extent. So I am going to give you a hand wavy argument uh, for the case of differential equations without going to the nitty gritty details. Uh, so that, uh, and, but, but it's still important that you sort of uh, get the big picture of what these models are, uh, and that's why I'm giving you. And also because later in your life, you will know what are some of the things you need to learn for the future. So differential equation is, of course, one of them you have to learn. Okay, so we have this, um, we, we have this equation now, and if you know some differential equation, we can reorganize this equation into this, and then this is the differential equation we want to solve. Um, what, but, but you might be wondering, why do we need differential equations? Uh, so um, the philosophy here is that if you have a function, if you know a function, so in this case, we know a function, let's say, uh, we know a function and you know some derivatives um, of that function for a certain point, certain point, and then with, with differential equations and knowing the derivative of some certain points, uh, for uh, a function that you already know, you can um, you can um, draw insights, conclusions about um, you know uh, about the entire domain for that function. So you know only few for a few points um, on that for that function, and you can um, you can make conclusions about the entire domain for that function. Um, okay, uh, so we. Um, all right, so all right, so so we want to solve this differential equation, and um, we have this. All right, now, um, now, the infection over the total number of population and the susceptible number, the number of susceptible people over uh, the total population. This is a fraction. I said this. This is a fraction. So I'm relabeling these fractions with smaller i o, i of t and the smaller s of t. Now the differential equations that we have, you see, um, for the infected people, I of t infected people, where it looks like we're taking sort of derivative here. So um, for the infected people, uh, what happens is beta is the uh, infection rate, and susceptible people come in contact with the infected people with the infection rate beta, and the infection rate increases. That's why it's a plus. The susceptible people. Uh, comes in contact with the infected people with beta, and, and it, since infection increases, uh, the number of uh, susceptible people decreases. Do you see that? I mean, the people from infected, a susceptible group joining the infected group. So uh, the susceptible group is decreasing, so we are, we are using a minus to indicate that. But then again, the total population would remain the same. So that is, since this is a fraction, and I'm talking in terms of probability, the total probability has to be one. Uh, so, you know, we look at that for an initial condition for time t is equal to zero. We get a differential equation eventually and we solve it. The solution uh, of that differential, you can, I mean, once you learn differential equation, you can solve differential equations. But for now, don't worry if you don't know the nitty gritty details of differential equation, but getting the higher level insights is far more important at this point as a freshman because you see a lot of uh, fake news online. Uh, media, so you can't really associate with yourself. So I want you to the ability to scientifically reason on the fake news before you share those 
or be panicked about, okay? Uh, so the solution looks like this. Um, and this gives you an exponential curve. Then again, it sort of uh, slows down here, right? So we will have an understanding of that soon. All right, so um, if time goes to infinity, so in this case, if t goes to infinity, e to the power minus infinity, and this term disappears, but this uh, i of zero remains. This term disappears, and i of um, you know i naught over i naught that gives you one. So uh, i of t is equal to one. So um, so that's what you get. And uh, in this case, uh, so this is one. So the number of susceptible people becomes zero, which means. Uh, so this image is for this uh, I, I, the, the, the assumption that we had made in this in this simple in this for this diagram is that I of zero is 0 0.05 and beta is 0.8 in this equation. So we get a graph like this. Now what this means is that initially we had a lot of susceptible people, less than 90 percent susceptible people, only 10 percent, you know, less than 0.9 susceptible people and point um, point uh, one you know, infected people. But eventually what happens is all these susceptible people got infected, uh, got infected. So, um, you know, the entire population got infected by the uh, virus. That's what this is suggesting. Um, okay. All right, so SIS model, this is yet another model. Uh, here, the idea is that we have susceptible group of people infected group of people and the infected people get susceptible again because they recover in the process so after the recovery they become susceptible again meaning healthy but you know um, also vulnerable at the same time because they might get infected by the uh, you know uh, by coming in close contact with the infected people so we have three groups here or they call it compartments so three compartments susceptible infected and susceptible so over here, uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be the total number of population is going to be the same susceptible and the infected, the total number of population will be the same. So beta remains the constant infection rate uh, on contact. And uh, we're introducing another parameter here, um, uh, another, um, um, uh, so it's gamma. Um, gamma is the recovery rate. So since we are allowing some sort of recovery from infected people, by the recovery, they become susceptible. So we need a recovery rate. And the time it takes for uh, recovery is one over gamma. Now the infection equation that we can get out of that is, um, all right, so, so have a look at this. This is the number of susceptible people and infected people. We're taking derivatives with respect to time. Uh, so if you look at the infected people, um, it's with the infection rate beta, susceptible people coming in contact with the infected people. And this is going to be the number of infected people minus uh, the gamma is the recovery rate. As I said, the gamma is the recovery rate. So gamma uh, multiplied with the infected people. So the number of infected people in this model gets recovered. And since they get recovered, we subtract them. We discard them from the uh, population of infected people. Since they're, the infected people are getting recovered, they're out of the infected population. Now they have susceptible population. They will be added. So these people it excluded from here and added to the susceptible people. So this bunch of people added to the susceptible people, taking from here. Now, uh, for the susceptible people, since infection increases is plus, susceptible people will start decreasing, so it's minus, but also getting um, um, the, 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 uh, the number of, uh, uh, so more people, infected people after getting susceptible, uh, getting added to the population of susceptible people. Now, for the initial condition, we can, uh, we can um, find uh, the initial value i0, and we get an equation like that. Notice beta minus gamma. So that suggests that, um, all right, so this term is really, looks, this term is constant. Um, so the solution, uh, the, using performing some sort of uh, differential equation, uh, so once you learn differential equation, you'll be able to solve it. The solution that we get out of that uh, is this. Uh, it has an analytic solution. So C over here means this. Um, now, if you notice, uh, beta minus gamma, what well, that suggests that if uh, beta is greater than gamma, uh, beta is the infected people, infection rate and gamma is the uh, recovery rate. So the infection rate is more than the recovery rate. 
then uh, we get the infected people um, this amount. And if the recovery rate is more than the infected people, then we get the infected people to be this amount, but it eventually tends to zero. But uh, how, let's see, let's uh, look at this information um, uh, with some sort of logistic function where beta is greater than, the, than gamma. So um, the infected people that we see due to the coronavirus, let's say, uh, it's increasing, increasing exponentially, and then we will have an answer to that, why it sort of flattens at that point. Um, now we're gonna have an exponential growth in this case, but it, the, the disease propagation will stop in this case. So uh, the, it will stop only when the uh, recovery rate is more than the um, uh, infection rate. So, but in the case of SIR model, and this is a, a real world practical model, and this is probably the model we can use for uh, modeling coronavirus, this specific SIR or SEIR, that kind of model will be uh, effective for modeling coronavirus uh, um, uh, outbreak or uh, epidemic. So we see that susceptible people uh, can get infected, coming in contact with infected people, and infected people, can recover. So there's a new addition here. Infected people can recover and, and that's pretty much the uh, uh, end of the cycle and the total population, susceptible, infected and recovered people is going to be the same number of people because we had an initial simplification assumption that you know, the, um, we assume that the population remains constant in a sense. The infection rate, beta, and the recovery rate, gamma, now the infection rate, that we, infection equations that we get out of that is uh, you see that susceptible people is going to be decreasing. We have three compartments here, so, so S, I, and R. So the number of susceptible people will decrease coming in contact with the infected people with a rate beta. Um, and uh, uh, infected people will increase. So we have positive previously, it was negative. Now it's positive because infected people are going to get increased. And infected people are also recovering. So the number of people that are recovering is going to be subtracted from this. So that, that would be the total number of infected people. And the people that are subtracted because they uh, got uh, recovered from infection with a rate of gamma, they're going to be the recovered people. So since S, I, and R, these are some fraction uh, probability in a sense, the total probability remains the same, so it's one. All right, so the equations that we get is this. Now, in the previous models that we have seen, uh, we were able to find analytic solution, but this time there's no analytic solution. We have to solve it very strategically. Uh, it's a differential equation, and we you know, sort of um, break it down to susceptible people in this case, and then the recovered people. Uh, so you break it down and you know, solve it by the differential equation, and we look for time with respect to the, um, uh, the recovered people, and this is the solution that we get. Now, let me bat on over here for a moment. I would like to uh, emphasize on this curve because this curve is quite significant. Uh, so beta over gamma, so the infection rate over the recovery rate, this is originally your R0. Uh, R subscript zero that, that I said at the outset of the lecture in the first few slides, if you recall, that was R naught. So what that means is, all right, so, so let me tell you this first, uh, I naught uh, is 0 0.1. So um, is, is 10 person of the population. So if 10 person of the population is infected to begin with, let's say, and, and then each person, coming in contact uh, with other people can infect four, all right, so each person coming in contact with four other people. So in this case, uh, so somebody has a coronavirus and he meets, you know, four different people. And, you know, if that continues to happen, this is a kind of graphical model we're gonna get, okay? So, um, so the red one is the infected people. So red one is infected people. So the infection, uh, you know, coronavirus, let's say, increases and then sort of decreases later and eventually it stops. Um, 
and, and, and the uh, green one is the susceptible people. So initially susceptible people, number of susceptible people were high, well, that was high uh, because um, you know, people were healthy to begin with and started dropping and dropping and dropping and it drops drastically, right? Almost uh, every, everybody, um, all right. So only a fraction of people are susceptible, remain susceptible in the end. Now the blue curve that you see, uh, this one is the people who recovered, uh, people who recovered. So the rec number of people recovered in the beginning that was very low, but you see exponentially started growing up and it sort of flattened out eventually at the top. What that means for the entire population is that all the, po the entire population got affected by the, let's say some virus, coronavirus, uh, which is quite dangerous to hear at the moment. Uh, so um, that means if entire population recovered, which also means the entire population got affected by that uh, virus. Um, so in that kind of thing will happen when each person will come in contact with four people or more, more than four people. If, if anything less than, uh, anything more than one people. So one affected person with coronavirus getting in contact with like two or three or more people, this kind of thing will happen. And you see the susceptible people, the entire population got affected. So this kind of thing might happen. But in the uh, case of coronavirus, if you recall, uh, look at the graph we talked about, the trajectory. Uh, this is the latest right at the moment. This is the graph you see. It's still increasing. It's still rising up for coronavirus, uh, which suggests that we are at this phase, at this phase. This is the area we are at at the moment, which means in the case of coronavirus, we are here which means it's at the, uh, the, it's an upward trajectory. We, are, we haven't reached the peak yet. So it's quite alarming for coronavirus now, as I can see. Now, once we reach at the peak and since, uh, all right, so why, why it started going down? I, I talked about, I'll, I'll, I said I'll tell you why that happened, okay? The reason that started dropping out, it looks like the car sort of ran out of fuel. So it's dropping down in this phase. Uh, because you see the number of susceptible people were high previously, but this time once it reaches at the peak, it means and almost the entire population got infected. So there is no way the virus can spread. So the idea here is that infected people cannot infect another infected people. So infected people can infect the susceptible people. So what that means is entire population is almost got infected. So there's no more people that you can infect afterwards. So that's why the curve sort of ran out of fuel and started dropping down. All right. And the recovered people increased, increased, and sort of flattened out, but it's not exactly one, it's slightly less than one, which means even after the outbreak of a virus or epidemic or pandemic, not all of them are going to recover, like not 100% of the people are going to recover who will survive eventually. Uh, so let's say 90%, uh, let's say, it, so the 90% is here, let's say, or 95%, um, or uh, some fraction of population, let's say 10 percent of population will um, will recover and then still get virus infected, but still recover. So the process will continue uh, for a small portion of people. So that, that's why it's not 100 percent. So some a good number of people, a relatively a small portion of people, will be infected, getting in contact still, and that uh, virus will will still going through the propagation phase a bit by bit. Um, even after the um, you know outbreak is gone, so which means uh, it, a pandemic or epidemic is uh, so dangerous that you know uh, uh, even after it goes away, it still remains uh, silently uh, in a certain portion of people. Let's say ten percent or fifteen percent of the people are going to get affected and recover, affected and recover. This thing will continue for a while. Now, what is the solution to this problem? Uh, so if you look at this graph, you see the beta over gamma, which is your R naught, as I said, 
so if it is 0.5 on an average for each of the stage, if you recall that tree we talked about, for each of the stage, if it is 0.5, meaning on an average, one infected person come in contact with less than one person, then this is what's gonna happen. Initial infected people remains the same. So uh, the blue ones are the recovered people. Uh, so the, and the trajectory remains uh, constant at this point, meaning that kind of thing, recovery infection at a slower rate will continue. And the infected rate, which the red one, the infected one was an upward trajectory. If you come in contact with the, you know, less than one, uh, one person, uh, so you, you choose self-quarantine or, you know, other people, you know, put you in quarantine or you're in the uh, medical health care or something. So if that happens, you know, the um, virus propagation uh, decreases and it sort of goes down and down all the way to sort of zero. So eventually it's almost going to stop. The, the, this kind of epidemic or pandemic will stop eventually. If you can make sure that you, can, you come in contact with less than one person uh, on an average. Uh, and from this recovery, uh, the blue graph you see from this recovery, we can do some sort of uh, differential equation. And then, you know, you see that this part is totally constant. So the derivative of R is going to be zero. So R infinity, which is the size of the people infected is uh, going to be constant. And we can get an uh, equation out of that. And the initial condition uh, we can impose on this. Uh, so at time zero, to begin with, uh, the number of recovered people was zero. So no, uh, no one recovered because no one got affected, let's say. Uh, all right, no one you know, sort of suffered. The small portion of people at time zero got infected. So it's a small portion of fraction of people get infected. And then S of zero, uh, this one is the susceptible people, you know, um, almost nearly one, like 100%, one probably, it's a probabilistic fraction. So nearly 100%, but slightly less than because some people are infected. So slightly less than one. Uh, so which means less, slightly less than 100% people are susceptible. And from here, we will solve for R naught. R naught, uh, going, if R naught is one, then that's the critical point. If we, so what, what that, we will solve this. And R naught, uh, sorry, R infinity is the total size of the outbreak. So uh, the damage, the number of total population got infected. That's the size of R infinity. Now the pan, uh, pandemic or epidemic threshold is that if R naught is greater than one, uh, and beta, and beta's infection rate is still greater than uh, uh, gamma. If that happens, the pandemic still remains. So the pandemic pervades; it's still active. So the the R infinity, the size of the outbreak, will be greater than some number, greater than zero. So it's a constant number, let's say. So the pandemic would continue to you know um, you know transmit all over the world gradually if. This is the condition, which is the condition for us now for the case of coronavirus. Now, the no pandemics will happen or epidemic will happen when each person coming in contact less than one, per one person on an average, and the gamma recovery rate is higher than the beta, which is the infection rate. If that happens, the size of the uh, outbreak will eventually uh, tends to go to zero, which means the pandemic or epidemic will stop eventually if we can if we can create a situation like that. Uh, so over here R naught we're talking about is the same thing beta over gamma, which is the um, you know time to recover minus time uh, that number of confirmed cases. It took time the time it took to get a bunch of confirmed cases. So that's the ratio we have and the basic reproduction number. So R naught is very important in this model. Uh, in fact, all the other previous models we've seen. Now, compartmental model summary. So, so far we talked about three compartmental models, SI, SIS, and SIR. So let's just see the quick summary of that. So susceptible people get infected, that's one model, and it grows exponentially and, you know, it slows down here. Um, it's not going exponentially, it's not, it's, it's not upward trajectory, it sort of flattens at that point. 
Uh, and the reason I explained in the previous graph, if you recall, why. Uh, so some people getting infected, some people getting, you know, recovered, and the process continues, and people start, you know, reducing uh, contact, personal contact, close personal contact, so things will sort of flatten out at that point. SIS model, susceptible people might get infected. So um, this is a good assumption to think about. So for example, if you have smallpox once in your lifetime, so you're never gonna get infected next time, right? So everybody has this kind of smallpox once in a lifetime and then they're not gonna get infected. Uh, so in that case, uh, we're not gonna assume that susceptible people, uh, people who are, who are infected became susceptible after recovery, they're not going to get infected all over again. So this model might not work for you know, uh, modeling smallpox. Smallpox happened to be uh, one of those pandemic and killed maybe 56,000 um, people, I don't know. Uh, um, I, 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 right. So 56 million people, I suppose. That's a lot of people. So in the SIR, which we can uh, use for coronavirus, uh, this one goes up and after a certain threshold, it starts to slow down, it will eventually slow down. But the bad news is we are still here at this point, and this is the dangerous phase, uh, so it still grows up. Uh, so, all right, so that these are the compartmental models. And another compartmental model I briefly uh, mentioned in, this, in, in, in the first few slides was SEIR model. I'll show you an, a, a paper on SEIR model, what that means quickly. Now flatten the curve. Uh, so uh, on social media, probably you are seeing this kind of curve. People are putting on their, you know, timeline cover photo or something. Um, so what that graph means is important to understand. Um, so this is the exponential curve we have seen. It grows up and then it sort of uh, slows down. So the pandemic, you know, it's is disastrous at this point, and then, um, but what we mean by flattening the curve is making this. So we sort of flatten things out by taking some preventive measures. So we try to stop mm, the virus propagation by you know, reducing contacts, taking some sort of medical health care and everything, you know, uh, support from government and people become very uh, careful about themselves and, you know, all these preventive measures can uh, we can take, but we can slow slow down the you know propagation. But that does not mean uh, less people are getting infected. Uh, so the area under this curve, so the area I know what that I'm sure you know what that means. Area under this curve, and the area under this curve is almost the same. So there's no difference. Uh, which means uh, if the area under the curve is same, the amount of stuff you can put in under this curve and the amount of stuff you can put in under the, put under this curve is going to be the same. But what difference does it make? Uh, uh, so the di only difference that it makes is that, um, so if this happens, if we have an upward trajectory like this, like certain outgrowth of you know, uh, coronavirus, then this is where our healthcare system, medical system. So we have limited capacity for ICUs, you know, uh, understanding of the virus and limited, um, you know, um, uh, medicine and other equipment. So this is the healthcare system. So, I mean, which is true for every country, not just Bangladesh, even the, you know, uh, when there's an epidemic or pandemic, I mean, it far exists your healthcare system. So there's an outgrowth, sudden, it happens suddenly, like boom, it happens like that. And if that happens, you see that um, your healthcare system cannot provide enough support to the people. Uh, so a lot of elderly people will die, a lot of people with their you know, weak immune system will die. Um, and some people who will survive, probably um, they will um, produce some antibody or something, I don't know. Uh, so some sort of resistance against the virus they will produce inside their body, and they might be able to survive if their, their immune system is good and everything like that. So only a few people will survive here. But if we take the preventive measures, it will only thing that we'll do is slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, okay? But still the same amount, almost the same amount of people will get infected. Um, by coronavirus or any other disease that's airborne um, droplet. 
So, but what that means, you see, since we were able to slow down the virus propagation, uh, our healthcare system could provide support. So uh, the number of ICUs we have, let's assume that we have 1,000 ICUs in Dhaka, okay? So 1,000 ICUs can, not enough, but let's say we have, like we increase more ICUs or maybe in a very rich country, they have like, you know, 10,000 ICUs or something. So that can sort of provide support, backup medical health care to the number of people getting infected. So, you know, less people are going to die. And so less people are going to die and some people will recover. And then eventually by the time, so it, it, um, it takes, all right, so it's sp the time span will be more which means a sudden outgrowth will not happen. Uh, it, will grow, it will grow gradually. And because of that, we could provide healthcare to the people with uh, you know, weaker heart or immune system or elderly people. So they are going to survive with the ICU and extra healthcare. So uh, less number of people will die. So you see, the curve that you see above, slightly above this, maybe a small fraction of people, this, fraction of people might die. So only a small fraction of people will die. There's an interesting research by um, uh, Imperial College London uh, and uh, another research by um, some scientists from China. If you look at this paper, this is the actual research paper, uh, a mathematical model for novel coronavirus epidemic in Wuhan, China. So uh, this guy, Yang and Wang, uh, this Chinese guy uh, from this university, of Tennessee uh, from the mathematics department published a research paper. Uh, this is the kind of research paper scientists basically publish uh, for COVID-19. So this guy um, modeled this problem and he used, let's see what model did he use. Uh, so I marked it here. So in, in my lecture, you've seen three compartments. Uh, we have four compartments in his uh, lecture, uh, in, in his research paper. So what these four compartments are susceptible as exposed, e, this is the addition, additional, com, uh, additional compartment, infected I and R. So S, E, I, R. So the last model that I introduced was S, R, S, I, R model. And his model is S, E, I, R, which is uh, something I also mentioned in my slide in the beginning. So he is uh, taking another extra uh, compartment and his model looks like this. We take the similar thing. We take, uh, uh, you know, uh, differential equations uh, based on our assumptions on the model, and then keep solving uh, for different things. We take different things into consideration for equilibrium state, and we have some simplification assumptions. Uh, so you see that R not less than one. What happens in that case? R not greater than one. What happens in that case? So this is an actual scientific research paper. Uh, so the understanding that you have by the lecture today, uh, you are, I mean, uh, so you, you see that they're taking, they're solving the differential equation in the extended form. Uh, you can read some original scientific paper now. And uh, if, once you learn differential equation, you might be able to understand it far better than now, but now you can at least see the scientific paper instead of sharing so much of Facebook news all the time. You can actually look for the cause and how it happens. Um, uh, so today we discussed about the original model that, you know, scientists uh, to, to, uh, to be very specific about the model and to really predict something about uh, virus propagation. You have to go for a numerical solution uh, using some numerical data and you can solve uh, this kind of curve and you, you can actually solve that. So they had extra parameter exposed. By exposed, they mean um, you come in contact with the person who is infected, but you may or may not get the infection. Uh, so, uh, because it, it's probabilistic, not everyone will get infected, okay? Um, so, you, now you can see the original paper, original research paper, and uh, that's, that's only based on Wuhan, China. And for China, it's uh, why, I, I sort of explained why uh, the you know, infection sort of slowed down and it's still slowing down. It's going, uh, it, so because people develop their, you know, antibody become, uh, you know, resistant to that virus, that things happen on a good immune system and all the other bunch of things, preventive measures. So that's one of the research papers. You might want to look at it later. 
And also recently you hear that Imperial College London scientists, uh, you know, predicted something and this thing is going on on the social media uh, relatively. So this is the original paper. Instead, I mean, instead of sharing those bunch of news, you can actually look at the original paper um, by Professor Neil Ferguson and his like team. See all, all these scientists, a group of scientists, a lot of scientists actually work together to model this uh, coronavirus thing for the um, for the British people, for only for England. Uh, so the model he used. Um, uh, so he developed uh, a model, and he's uh, he used, all right. Let's see what model he used. So a method transmission model. He used individual based simulation model. So individual based model. It's another kind of model, and it's called a uh, agent based model as well. So uh, he used a different model, uh, only um, all right to to simulate the um, the virus propagation for British uh, people only in England, so he used a bunch of data, data collected from WHO and other, I don't know, British census or something. So you need data. So you want to, when you, I mean, today, in today's lecture, initially we talked about the original mathematical model, the ideas underpinning mathematical construction that goes behind this um, kind of virus propagation. But when you're doing something numerically exact, for, you look for a numerical solution for that. And you need um, uh, data for that. You collect data from the government census and different places. And this is the original paper published from Imperial College London. And this, they, they predicted that uh, if the British government uh, does not do anything at all, like you know, they, the, their lifestyle remains the same, uh, five, uh, uh, five lakh people will die. But uh, if the British government uh, takes some preventive measure, um, you know, partial lockdown and things like that. And, you know, given that people also uh, follow some of the preventive measures, like they don't contact with other people, like we're telecommunicating today. I'm staying at home, I'm home quarantined, uh, you're home quarantined. So if that happens, then um, slightly more than two lakh people die in England, uh, if that happens. But if the British government uh, goes for a complete lockdown of their like, entire England, then only 20,000 people die. Okay? So that is what uh, um, Professor Ferguson's research suggested uh, this, from this uh, Imperial scientist, a group of Imperial College, scientists, Imperial College London scientists suggested to the British government. And the British government started uh, taking his opinion seriously. And uh, they started taking some preventive measures based on his model. And that is uh, exactly um, what you see in here. Uh, so in this case, if you follow the preventive measures, then the number, um, because your healthcare system can provide support, still like the Ferguson's, uh, uh, Professor Ferguson's research suggested, if Britain goes for a complete shutdown, still uh, complete lockdown, still 20,000 people die. So let's say this is the 20,000 people that, that they're gonna suffer eventually. Um, so I am worried about Bangladesh, what will happen. And in fact, the world is worried about what's happening around the world because we are, still at this trajectory level, at this upward trajectory level, it's gonna up and up and up all the time. Um, so I try to give you uh, the knowledge that you need uh, to understand mathematical model. And I've shown you how to uh, look for the actual research paper published by the original scientist. Um, in, I mean, that's what scientists do. They, they do the research and publish research paper. Uh, so by the time, maybe uh, in, maybe by, by the next few semesters, you will learn some differential equations, and I will also teach you some exponential curves a lot more in detail, and also I will show you the logarithmic curves so, uh, in greater detail. So this is on the uh, this is on the linear scale, but when I do this kind of um, um, all right, so if I convert this into logarithmic scale, um, we can draw more insights out of this graph. So we'll also talk about logarithmic scale later. So now I believe you have some sort of familiarity with uh, original research, um, how original research is done and what mathematical model means um, for the entire population at this moment. Uh, so um, the reason I wanted to give this lecture is because um, 
it, um, we expect better from the next generation. So you are the next generation. So, um, I mean, we, we cannot expect more from the older generation, but we are hopeful for the next generation. As a university teacher, I, if I can provide you the right tools and techniques and methods and mathematical and intellectual understanding that you need to, um, uh, to need at the moment, then when you grow up, you will assume some sort of leadership position at the administrative level, at the political level, at the scientific level. So I expect that the next generation with the right knowledge and their leadership skill will be able to value knowledge. And based on that, they will, if they take decisions, the loss can be minimized. Uh, so uh, if we go back to the last slide, flattening the curve, what happens here is see that uh, after taking the, all the preventive measure at the extreme level, still 20,000 people are dying at England. Uh, what well, that means, uh, a, a positive leadership would be to accept the fact there would be a loss during the time of pandemic. I cannot deny that. Denying that and, you know, denying that and saying that's my success is not a very good form of uh, intellectual leadership. What is a good form of intellectual leadership would be to accept the fact there will be some loss, but as a leader, your success, you define your success in minimizing the loss. So over here, you take all the measures that you need, you minimize the loss. So that's the best form of intellectual leadership I expect from the next generation. Uh, so you minimize the loss, that's the right mindset for leadership, I believe. Um, and if you're interested, uh, you can uh, read um, the rest of the papers. The original paper came out of Imperial College London. Imperial College London is one of the top universities in the world, uh, third ranked third in UK. Um, now this is a good paper too, and, and you can also track the coronavirus situation every day from the John Hopkins University. Uh, John Hopkins University is um, the number one university for public health. So they talk about malaria and all these different kinds of diseases. Uh, so they do mathematical modeling and things like that. Um, so I hope I tried to convey the message I wanted to give you um, by doing a special lecture for today on pandemics and epidemics and mathematical model understanding. Um, next time, um, I would like to give you a lecture on uh, probability theory. Uh, so and the Oxford notes that I gave you, uh, gave you um, so that was a small note, only 14 page. Um, I, ex I hope to go over them maybe one setting or a couple of settings and uh, that will help you to construct a probabilistic model later in the future. We'll learn probabilistic model. So what are some of the things that we learned uh, previously? Uh, you know, exponential modeling. We also learned quadratic modeling and we did a lot of graphical analysis. So this course, um, we're almost at the end of the course. Uh, we will learn uh, only a few things here and there uh, to wrap things up. Uh, but I think, um, you know, you're taking away a lot of good skills and good um, familiarity with some of the useful skills that you need for uh, the future. And that was the goal for today's lecture. Uh, thank you everybody for joining um, the conversation. And if you have any question, you might want to ask. Um, you are very much Sir, welcome. is this lecture included in our syllabus? Um, I mean, I, I, um, all right, so included in a sense, I might ask some, you know, basic conceptual questions, um, not a very rigorous mathematical question. Uh, I might ask you, I mean, since I explained the graph, so I might give you a graph and, you know, ask you some conceptual questions. So understanding some of the graphs are going to be important. So um, it's going to be only conceptual. It's not going to be very difficult at all. Okay. And you are already good at graph and I explained the graph and video will be available after the um, after lecture tonight or tomorrow. So you, you'll be able to go over that. You will be when will be our next class? Um, I will announce that in Slack. I will announce that.